This special event has been put together to help inform and educate our families, share resources in our state, and talk about ways to help prevent a crisis with a loved one with disabilities from becoming a preventable tragedy. The Utah Parent Center was founded on the concept of parents helping parents. We all have children with special needs and can relate to many things you are going through. Many of the staff at, the, at our center are parents of youth or young adults who have experienced the same worries as many of you here today. Here with us today, we have Amanda McNabb. She is the clinical staff development educator at the University Neuropsychiatric Institute, otherwise known as UNI. She is the Safe Care Transition Follow-Up Program Supervisor and Crisis and Diversion Services, within Crisis and Diversion Services. The title of her presentation today is Don't Tell Me to Calm Down, De-Escalation and Crisis Intervention Options. Without further ado, we will invite Amanda to share her screen for her presentation and hand it over to her. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so as uh, Esperanza was so nice to tell you about me, I am the Staff Development Educator with Crisis and Diversion Services at UNI, which is basically the fancy word for the trainer. So I work and um, know all of our different programs, which is something that we're going to talk about uh, today at the end of the presentation about what um, resources and things are available to you through crisis and diversion services. I am also the supervisor of our Safe Care Transitions program, which is a program where we provide follow-up for individuals who have been seen in the ED or in an inpatient setting within the university system um, to just follow up with them after uh, their discharge and check in with them to make sure that they're getting their needs met and being able to receive follow-up services within the community itself. So I always like to start my presentations with a quick disclaimer. So this presentation is really intended as a resource. It's not necessarily an advertisement for the resources that we'll discuss at the end, but it's really more for information and sharing of what could potentially be out there to assist. Any opinions expressed during this presentation are solely mine. Um, I do not, and yet I do, represent the University Neuropsychiatric Institute and the University of Utah Healthcare. And for some, what we talk about may be triggering. It may be difficult to hear. It may uh, make people feel overwhelmed. And that's okay. You know, if you need to step back, uh, take a moment for yourself, please do so. And if you need some extra support, let us know. You know, when we're talking about children, we're talking about individuals with disabilities, we're talking about crisis. All of those things are pretty emotional spaces for those of us who live with it on a daily basis. During the presentation, I'm hoping to talk about what a crisis looks like, what techniques are out there for de-escalation, and what resources are available, and when it's a good time to utilize them. So let's start by talking about what a mind in crisis really looks like. Crisis, in its formal definition, could be seen as a perception or experience of an event or situation as intolerably difficult, and it exceeds the person's current resources and coping mechanisms. In other words, it overwhelms the individual's ability to function. The crisis itself is defined by the individual. Maybe we have an idea what that crisis may be, the source, what it looks like, but ultimately it is up to the person experiencing the crisis to say whether it is or not. Crisis can be both a danger and an opportunity for change. For those of us who have ever experienced a crisis ourselves, we know that it can be a turning point for some of us. Right now we're in the middle of a crisis within our society on multiple levels. But if we think about, say, the pandemic, right, that is a crisis 
happening every single day. And there's lots of choices and decisions that we make on individual bases, on systems, within work environments, family environments, every level. We're constantly having opportunities for change and potential opportunities that would pose a danger to the individual. So when we're talking about crisis, one of the things that we need to look at is really how the brain works. Because the brain is a big part of what makes up a crisis. So I pose the question, and I know that some of you are gonna think, okay, this is a trick question, but how many brains do we actually have? All right, that's an interesting question because we're all taught we have one brain. But ultimately, we have three. We have one organ, but we have three separate parts of our brain. If you think about your hand as a picture of the brain, so if you make a fist, this bottom part right here where it connects to your wrist, this is your reptilian brain, or it's the primitive part of the brain. That's the part of the brain that deals with your automatic systems, breathing, blinking, it also deals with your survival. So if anybody's ever heard of fight, flight, or freeze, when somebody is in a crisis situation, those are the three most often used ways of, response, of responding. So with flight, you run the other direction. With fight, you get ready to physically fight if needed. And freeze is where you shut down and you can't think of what my next steps are or what I should do going forward. Then if you take that fist and you open up the palm, that top of the palm is what we call the limbic system or the mammalian part of the brain. Whereas the, the bottom is your reptilian part of the brain. This is the part that deals with emotions. It deals with whether I feel loved, whether I feel that I am missing something. It's the emotional pieces that we deal with on a regular basis. And when we have somebody in crisis, that part is very dysregulated. That is the part of the brain that kind of seems to be haywire at the moment. And then when you have your fist, you have this closed part at the top, and this is your uh, frontal lobe or your neocortex. That's the part of the brain that deals with reason and logic and also the part that tells us what's socially acceptable or not socially acceptable. It's the area of the brain that isn't fully developed in what we would call a typical brain until after the age of 25. So it takes a while for that part of the brain to develop. Now think about somebody who has early trauma, who has used substances early in their life, or has been born with some sort of developmental disability. That part of the brain is impacted. And so what we may see as a abnormal behavior may be baseline for that individual. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So what does a brain in crisis actually look like? When we think about a brain in crisis, we're really looking towards behaviors and emotions because ultimately it's about survival skills. Even though when we really look at them, they may not be the most functional type of skills. So we may have an individual who presents with feelings of being out of control. Right? They can't regulate their behavior. They can't regulate their emotions. They're all over the place. They may be angry or hostile. What we know about anger is that it's a secondary emotion. There's always something underneath it. So I often will use my daughter. Um, so I have a seven-year-old with ADHD and anxiety. And I use her as an example when she becomes incredibly overwhelmed or she's really frustrated, she becomes very angry. 
this is a very sweet little girl, but she can throw a fit like nobody else. And it's anger and hostile <clears throat> because at the time she doesn't have the words to describe it. And so it comes out in her behaviors. And she really looks like a, a demon child, unfortunately, in some of those moments. Um, luckily, we're slowly working on some coping skills and some behavior pieces in order for her to be able to express that emotion even when the verbal part fails. They may present with sadness or despair. It may look like depression. It may just look like constant tears. It may look like some bouts of sadness. It depends on the individual. And as we go through this, I want you to think about your child or your children or the person that you have in your life that has brought you to joining us today. What are the things that they look like when they are in some form of crisis? We may also see anxiety or fear. So we would see um, behaviors trying to avoid something that's going on. Maybe when they're anxious, there is nail biting or some form of self-harm in order to alleviate what's going on. Now, I will disclose to our group that I have a younger brother, he's about two years younger than I am, who is moderate to severely autistic. He currently lives in a group home and he has a lot of behaviors related to when he's feeling out of control or is experiencing depression and anxiety. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more as we're going through kind of how he presents and use him as an example of what may or may not be seen and what may or may not help with de-escalation. We may also see somebody who's not eating or sleeping on their regular schedules or are struggling with overeating and oversleeping. And a lot of these things, it doesn't matter if it's somebody with a atypical brain or what we would, again, call a typical. So somebody who is uh, considered the norm for looking at behaviors and um, emotional regulation. These things are across the board, but sometimes they're expressed a little bit differently. We know that somebody with a developmental disability experiences a lot of stress or they have a high vulnerability to that. They also can have challenges when it comes to applying different coping skills and skills to help regulate themselves. Again, that frontal lobe, that part that's logical and can think through consequences is not necessarily fully developed. And so they're going to struggle with these pieces and need external supports instead of an internal process. We also know that individuals with developmental disabilities have fewer opportunities for wellness. There's a lot less resources available for them. And a lot of times we find that they get kicked around the system. You know, nobody wants to deal with the costs. So insurance isn't going to say, yes, we'll provide mental health services because they have a developmental disability and therefore they can't benefit from it, which is completely untrue. There are plenty of individuals who have a level of developmental disability that could absolutely benefit from mental health services, whether that be therapy, um, medication management, you know, anything along that continuum and spectrum. But ultimately, they get pushed aside and fall through the cracks, which is not fair for them, and it's not fair for everybody who loves them. We know that these individuals are often at a greater risk for victimization and abuse, which we know leads to trauma. And you have an individual who can't necessarily make sense of the world around them in, on a general basis, and now they've had trauma involved as well. What kind of supports are there really out there for them? We also know that there is a pretty high frequency of co-occurring mental health diagnoses. Again, depression, anxiety. Um, 
looking at some of them, it, it kind of becomes a chicken and the egg, which came first with the behaviors that you see. Is it because of the lack of understanding within social norms, or is it because of the mental health diagnoses? And is it if they feel like they're not fitting in because they recognize they're different, is that causing the depression and anxiety pieces? We know that individuals with uh, developmental disabilities could have deficits in multiple areas. Um, we call them domains in, you know, therapist language, but uh, one of the ones could be practical domains, such as applying basic skills for daily living, personal care, job responsibilities, money manage management, public transportation, all of those things. This is an area where my brother really struggles. He, as many times as you tell him, don't put metal in the microwave, he'll do it anyway. Uh, especially if it's related to ice cream, because he likes to melt the ice cream in the microwave for some reason. Um, his ability to take care of himself personally, take showers and things like that, he needs a lot of prompting in order to do those things, and will get frustrated with his staff when he, he gets prompted frequently about it. Um, we've had him go to job shop and other supportive jobs, and it's... Uh, hasn't worked very well in most situations for various reasons. Part of that is he's really stubborn and if you tell him to do something and he doesn't want to, he's not going to do it. Uh, that's been him since birth. So his ability to complete tasks can be very impaired uh, depending on what they are. If it's something that he likes to do or something that he wants to do, that's a different story. He's actually really good at computers and can often wipe off hard drives and lock people out of things if you give him the opportunity to do so. Conceptual domain. So that's the ability to apply some of those skills that they're taught in school. So reading, writing, math, maybe even conceptually um, with when we're talking about memory. Abstract thought can be very difficult for individuals with developmental disabilities. And so we need to be very concrete with them. And especially when they're in crisis, we may have to be very directive. At the same time, we want individuals to feel like they have some sort of control because that may be part of what's triggering that particular crisis for them. So we're gonna talk about being able to provide choices for the individual, even if they're choices that they don't really want. And then social domain. So utilizing empathy, interpersonal communication skills, verbalizing what it is that's going on for them, having a conversation that's mutually um, inclusive instead of just a monologue of one person talking. Because of these deficits, individuals can be become more in crisis because something has failed for them. Whether it's on the practical, conceptual, social domains, something has gone awry and they're not used to figuring out what to do or in some cases not capable of doing so. As we're talking, we're talking about a spectrum. So that's why it's really hard to say, you know, 100% of the time you should do this or 100% of the time this is what it looks like because everybody is somewhere along a spectrum of difficulties and challenges that happen for them. We know about 85% of our population of individuals that would be classified as having a disability um, fall within the mild area. So they may have difficulties within the conceptual domain, that reading, writing, math type of area, but they can still have jobs, live independently, go about their lives and function on a level that feels uh, comfortable for them. About 10% would fall under moderate, 5% would be severe, and about 1% falls under profound. And of course, these are all rounded up and rounded all over the place because obviously that 
if you were to add it up, it's not, it's a little over 100%. But what we're looking at is what's going to generally work and apply for the individual. Because no one thing is going to work for everybody. And it really depends on where their challenges and strengths may be. Because that's the other piece that we really want to look at is strengths. So when we have individuals who are at baseline dealing with different challenges, we may see behaviors that would be really concerning in somebody else. So in the event, or in the event, in the case of my brother, he has a lot of self-injurious behavior when he becomes overwhelmed emotionally, whether it's anxiety or depression or frustration. He actually bites the back of his hand and has a lot of scar tissue. Um, we got a call just this past week from the manager of his house saying that he'd had a really rough day and he had bitten the back of his hand and it was bleeding. Um, they were going to clean it up and see if he needed stitches. He's never actually needed stitches on it, um, but that was still kind of a scary thought of, oh, he's done something so bad that he's going to need that level of medical intervention. For him, that's a learned behavior that has worked for him in self-soothing. Is it one that we would have wanted him to keep? Probably not. There's definitely better ways. Um, however, it's better than when he used to hit himself in the head and give himself a black eye. Again, poor hygiene may be something that for uh, individuals would be considered normal as an abnormal behavior. But for individuals with developmental disabilities, that may be just a part of who they are and how they function. So it isn't necessarily a sign that it is a, um, a crisis coming. You know, if we had somebody who was dealing with depression, we may see poor hygiene as a red flag for, okay, they're really struggling with what's going on. But for an individual who um, that's part of their baseline, we're going to have to look for other signs. We do have impulsivity. Again, that's the part of the frontal lobe. So um, one of the reasons that we have kids that are so impulsive is because, again, that frontal lobe doesn't really uh, fully develop until 25. And then if you have somebody who has um, a developmental process going on, we're going to see a higher level of impulsive behaviors, which could make crisis even more dangerous for them. Um, and that should say talking to uh, instead of taking to um, or seeing unseen others. You know, my brother had an imaginary friend, or at least that's what we thought, because the concept of friends was something that we had to teach with him. Um, but he would talk and play with things that weren't there. For some people, they'd think, okay, this is, this is a mental health issue. This is a crisis. But for others, that was part of his baseline. Um, and it may be part of their baseline. What we know is that distress is expressed through behavior. So that's what we really need to pay attention to when we're trying to determine what's going on. We also need to look at where that behavior is coming from. Maybe that behavior is a way to escape or avoid the demands of an activity that they don't want to do. So with um, an individual who is being asked to do a certain task, we may see them start to act out in a way because it takes the attention away from having to do the task. Is this behavior a way to gain attention from others? So in working with the crisis and diversion services, we've had experiences with individuals who have reached out for support and um, have utilized our services who have developmental disabilities. And one particular case, we found that she would text in using our SafeUT text app and constantly talk about suicide and wanting to kill herself. She would express having a plan. She would occasionally tell us that she was actively drinking bleach or things like that. And ultimately what we found out is her goal was to get us to call police to come out because, because she liked police having um, 
she liked having the attention from them and getting the reinforcement of what they would say to her um, and how they would try to intervene with her. So we had to come up with a different way of managing her distress. We also found that saying she was suicidal was a way of saying that she was hurting in some manner. And so again, we had to look at how we were intervening in those situations so that we weren't calling police all the time. Um, and there's been several times where we've reached out to family members because we were given permission to do so. And they were able to say, um, you know, no, she's not drinking bleach. She's sitting on the couch next to me. She's safe. And then we could feel a little um, safer knowing that she was being watched and taken care of in that moment. Um, it may be a way to obtain tangible items or opportunities. There uh, was a presentation on a similar topic where the individual talked about uh, constantly seeing the same person in the ER. And what they found out was they would act out and express um, being in a crisis situation through their behavior in order to come to the ED and get a sandwich. For some reason, they really wanted the sandwiches from the ED. They also wanted the attention. They liked the staff there and they felt like the staff treated them well. And it became a reinforcer um, when they would behave that way, get taken to the ED and get what they wanted. We also have to look at behaviors as potential learned behaviors or caused by a medical condition. With my brother, he has language. Um, a lot of it's very rote. He's learned specific questions um, that are socially acceptable to have a conversation. So they're very um, strange questions sometimes, such as, what did you do last night? What did you have for dinner? Uh, what did you dream about? There are times where his language fails him quite often, and especially when he's not feeling well. So we have to look at the behaviors and what he's doing to figure out what's happening. There was another case, um, not with my brother, but where the individual kept hitting themselves in the head because they had an ear infection, but they couldn't communicate that they were having an ear infection and they were using the behavior and the pain that it was creating in order to get rid of or at least decrease the focus on the pain in their ear. So they weren't able to express it verbally, but they did so with their behavior. And this was a behavior that was new. So that's another piece to look at is, is this something new for the individual? Because that may say, this person's in distress, this person is in crisis, if it's something that has a sudden onset. So when we have somebody who's presenting in crisis, how do we respond? What do we do for them? When we look at a normal crisis cycle, we start off at baseline, something triggers. We could intervene there and decrease back to baseline, or it could escalate depending on what's happening. That's another point where intervention could happen and prevent a crisis from breaking if we think about that being the breaking point for the individual. Once we reach crisis, there's not a lot of things we can do except to help deescalate the situation. We're not gonna talk them out of uh, necessarily reacting because it's too late. We also can't figure out necessarily prevention because again, it's too late. So there's a calming down period. And then for most, there's a crash where we may see the individual become um, tired. And I'll, again, I'm gonna use my brother a lot. I apologize. But um, after he's had a, a major blow up, a major tantrum where he self-harmed and he's um, reached that kind of crisis point, when he calms down, we'll often see him take a nap afterwards because he's expressed so much energy that he doesn't know what else to do. Again, he can't talk through it at that point. Um, and really, there's not a lot of discussion with him because again, we're, 
rote language. So if he's gotten in trouble, um, his standard line is no more bad things. And we know that he's trying to express that he's not going to do it again, but ultimately he's going to do it again because that's just a part of who he is and how he responds to things. So when we have an individual in crisis, a child with a developmental disability or somebody that we're working with, we have to remember to take care of ourselves first because if we're in crisis, we're not gonna be able to help them. So one of the biggest things that we can do is breathe. And if we can get the individual to breathe with us, that's fantastic. That increased oxygen flow, that, uh, I would call it a diversion sometimes. Um, being able to redirect the energy can be really helpful for de-escalating a situation. Modeling behaviors, keeping a calm voice, a calm body. With my brother, when my father would react, so if my brother was having a tantrum and my father would react, it would actually escalate the situation because he would feed off of the energy and the frustration and anger that my father was expressing at the time. But with my mom and I, um, we're actually both clinicians, by the way, whenever we maintained a calm voice, calm body, we were able to de-escalate him a lot faster. We're going to communicate. So we're going to listen. And listening doesn't necessarily mean the verbal cues. We're gonna look at those behaviors. That's listening to the whole person. We're gonna validate the person. And that may be a verbal, that may be a comforting move, depending on the individual and what works for them. We're gonna present those options. And again, it doesn't always have to be verbal. For some of our kids, having a um, chart with different activities or different options or ways of communicating that they can point to when the words aren't there can be very helpful for them. And we're going to allow choices. Even if those choices are not things that they really want to do, we're going to allow them to have some control in the situation. Although, of course, we also have to take into consideration safety. So everything is going to be about safety first. So we want to allow choices, but as long as they're still within a safe realm for the individual. So just a brief note on listening. It really requires concentration and energy. It involves connection with the individual. And I have speaker here, meaning the person who's expressing. So it may be the individual who's acting out and the behavior that's happening. Um, so our children and what they're trying to communicate to us through either words or behaviors. We have to be able to see things from that other person's perspective. So why would somebody find this situation so frustrating? You know your child best. You know the people that you're working with best. So what is it from their perspective that may be causing the crisis in the moment. It also requires that we suspend judgment and evaluation. So something that may seem trivial to us, something not important, may be very important to that individual. Right now we're dealing with um, continuation of crisis points with my brother around um, DC Universe. He really wants to be able to access it on his smart TV. And we've told him right now we're not going to do um, any type of account on it because we haven't found a way to do it without attaching a credit card. And we're really afraid to let him loose on there with a credit card attached because who knows what he will get into. And so for us, having access to DC Universe is no big deal. But for him, he lives in a world of superheroes. That's one of the biggest things that he relates to. Um, with my brother, he relates to Star Wars, Star Trek, 80s cartoons, and superheroes. That is his world. And it's very interesting with him because he gets very fixated on 
certain, um, oh, and the Peanuts gang, that would be the other one. Uh, he gets very fixated on the fact that you don't see the parents in the Peanuts gang. And for a long time, we couldn't figure it out. We weren't able to hear what he was trying to communicate to us. And we finally figured it out. He's worried that there's nobody taking care of the children, which is another way of him expressing that he's worried about not being taken care of and not being a part of the family. It's taken us a very long time to figure that one out. Um, and now whenever he tries to bring up the Peanuts gang, we redirect away from that and remind him that it's about the kids, that the parents are there, you hear them talking, but it's about the children themselves. So how do we communicate? As hard as it is, because a lot of times we're dealing with family members, which means that we're often uh, more frustrated and more connected and struggle the most, we have to try to remain as patient and calm as we can when they are in crisis, because they're going to feed off of us and our energy. So if we're coming in hot and frustrated and not listening to what's happening for them, then they're going to react to it. We want to be friendly and we want to be firm. And it's okay to be directive and concrete. That's probably the best language that they're going to hear when we do so. It's also safer if we give them directions and concrete things that they can do. Because again, abstract thought isn't there. They're not necessarily going to think, okay, in order for me to calm down, I need to take three breaths and I need to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to have to direct them in that. We want to be simple and brief. If we're utilizing verbal prompts, we want to make sure that we're choosing our words correctly and on their level. Again, remember, there's that continuum of things going on. So for some people, certain words are going to communicate what we need to happen. For others, it's going to go right over their head and they're not going to be able to hear it. And what works when somebody's calm and the language that we use when they're calm may not necessarily work when they're in crisis. So we have to figure out what works best for the individual. We really want to be empathic and let them know that we are hearing them and understanding that right now something's going on for them. Maybe that's saying, I know this hurts, or this really looks like it's hurting you. Let's do X, Y, and Z. Or let's just do X. You know, keep it simple, keep it brief. Just do one type of thing. We can redirect and say, I hear you at the same time. Even if they're not verbally expressing anything, we can say, you know, I see what's going on for you and I want to work with you on this. When somebody's in crisis, we want, to, we want to try to remove the upsetting influence or whatever has been triggering it, if we can. You know, there are definitely times where that um, influence isn't something that we can remove. But if it is something more physical, concrete, and we can, then we need to do so. Sometimes we need to remove the audience. So we have to um, walk away from the behavior, as long as it's safe, of course, and allow that person to continue to act out, even if we know that um, it's not what we want in that moment. We really do want to look for um, distracting or disrupting the unwanted or dangerous behavior that's happening. So when somebody's in crisis and if they are self-harming, we want to try to redirect that energy to something else. Or if we see that somebody's starting to get emotionally and worked up, we can disrupt that behavior and cycle by um, using that distraction or some other um, way of communicating instead of allowing it to progress. Of course, when we're trying to de-escalate somebody, we really want to be aware of our movements, shouting, rapid orders, things like that, because it's they're already in a high emotional state and that's just going to make it worse.
We also want to look at our tone and how we are communicating non-verbally um, with body language and position and things like that. Direct eye contact may be an issue for somebody. And we also want to avoid touching or crowding that individual. In some cases, touch is okay. Again, you know your children. So there may be situations where um, letting them alone and not touching them so that they can calm down is um, a bad idea. And sometimes it's a really good idea. There can also be ways of doing things without um, increasing aggression. So with my brother, when he's biting, um, we will oftentimes put our hands on his and just gently pull his hand down firmly, you know, not letting him swing, but gently pull his da hand down and we'll say, don't hurt my AJ. And for him, that has become a trigger of, um, okay, we need to, to do something else. Uh, and that's when we can try to ask him short questions or use a verbal, or sorry, a nonverbal way of communicating what he needs. Uh, we'll also straight up ask him when he's self-harming, um, does your head hurt? Does your tummy hurt? Because he can say yes or no to those type of things. Again, looking at crisis, looking at de-escalation, we really want to look at the ABCs. And some of you may be very familiar with these, but we're looking at what set off the situation. What were the behaviors that we saw and what were the consequences or the payoffs to those behaviors? So did they get a need met? And again, it may not have been in the most functional and positive way, but ultimately something was met for them in that moment. We also want to look at even before the trigger of what has kind of set up these behaviors. So if this is an individual who has a long-standing history of aggression. So one of my brother's um, roommates has a significant aggression towards women. And so we've looked kind of well, staff have looked back at the history, and he came from a very abusive home where there was domestic violence and he witnessed it. So he witnessed domestic violence against his mother, and then he was also abused by his father. And so aggression, when he's upset and in crisis, is something that he's learned how to express himself with. Unfortunately, that means any staff that are female often become the target. Um, and he's gone after staff before to express what he's needed in that moment or that crisis point for him, which is very dangerous, obviously, for staff. And it's dangerous for him to be um, at that level of aggression because he himself could get hurt. When we're talking about de-escalation, we're also talking about general safety. So if we can, giving personal space. You know, this may be somebody who's never been aggressive before at all. And this one time could be the moment that they strike out. So with my brother, he was taught from a very young age. Um, we have two younger brothers after him. Um, he kind of grew up parallel to the one that's two years younger than him. Um, they met developmental milestones kind of together at that point. He was diagnosed with autism at two. And so our brother Brian was born when he was four and they just kind of grew up together. But then we have a, another younger brother named Matthew. And Matthew was the baby. And Andrew's very sound sensitive. So when the baby would cry, he would pick the baby up and he would drop the baby. So he was taught very, very young, you don't touch the baby. You don't hit, you don't hurt. Um, he was struggling. And of course, we didn't know what was happening for him. And one day he actually pushed my mother. And that's something that was very, very strange for him. And we knew something was wrong. So we were able to uh, eventually, through multiple things, figure out that he was really struggling with anxiety and depression at the time. And we were able to get him help. But in those moments when somebody is really emotional, you want to make sure that you are personally safe as well as them.
So we want to look at distance um, when it's needed, having a, a certain posture um, that's relaxed so that you aren't trying to intimidate or overwhelm, but also isn't something where you could get hit as easily. And we want to be aware of our surroundings. So if um, you're dealing with a child who's in crisis, it could be a school situation, it could be home, it could be out in public, knowing where your exits are or knowing at least where you can move if that crisis were to become physical as needed. So what resources are out there? Say you've done everything you can to try to de-escalate the situation. Sometimes just being who you are is going to continue the crisis situation. Not every child is going to respond the way they do to their parent, that, uh, to a stranger. So um, I know with my daughter, she's fantastic at school. Come home and she's a terror. She's demanding, she wants everything under the sun. Part of that is our fault. She is an only child and has been catered to as also the only grandchild on both sides of the family. So we've, we've got a little bit of a spoiled uh, situation going on that we're trying to correct as best we can. But de-escalation hasn't worked. Being able to stay calm, to redirect, to really talk to the individual and find out what's happening and what need they need, they want met. When do we reach out to other people? So part of Crisis and Diversion Services, my department that I work in, we are both the county crisis line for Salt Lake County and the statewide crisis line for the entire state of Utah. Both of those numbers, 801-587-3000 and 800-273-TALK, will lead to the same group of individuals. We work uh, with professionals, we work with families, we work with patients, we work with everybody under the sun. Sometimes it's about referrals, sometimes it's about discussion, sometimes it's just validation that what you're going through is difficult. You know, you yourselves are here to learn about de-escalation and learn about ways to support your loved ones, but ultimately you need support too. And that's where the crisis line can be a resource because they can talk you through a situation with your loved one and they can also talk to you about the stress that having uh, somebody who's in crisis in your life be a part of. The crisis line also, um, well, I should say in conjunction with the crisis line, we also have a state warm line and there's both a local number as well as a statewide toll-free number. And that statewide toll-free number just went into effect. Um, just this last legislative cycle did the warm line become a state warm line. And it's run by certified peer support specialists. These are individuals who have personal experience within the world of mental health and substance abuse recovery. These are individuals who are parents who are loved ones, who um, have experiences within the system as well, and are there to provide support and empowerment and really focus on the recovery and journey of function uh, within the home, within society, within whatever domain that may be being affected. So this is another great resource as a parent um, or caregiver to be able to utilize for your own support. They're there seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. The crisis line is 24-7. We are always there. Um, this past year has been very interesting for a lot of us with the hurric um, hurricane force winds, the uh, earthquake that we had. We had some disruption in services, but we were there through all of it and talking through individuals who were struggling themselves, but also how do you help somebody who has a developmental disability understand what's happening in those moments? Some of them may be more affected than others at times. We also have a mobile crisis outreach team here in Salt Lake County. We have them um, in various areas throughout the state. 
uh, they're each run by the local mental health authority in those areas, but the crisis line, the 801-587-3000 or the um, 800-273-TALK is the dispatch for those groups. Right now we have mobile crisis teams in Weber, Davis, Salt Lake, Utah, and Washington counties. And by the end of the year, we will have teams through Bear River, um, Bear River Mental Health, Summit Mental Health, Northeastern, Four Corners, and San Juan. So we're having more and more teams available. And what their role is, is to go out into the community, do face-to-face -face assessment, help with de-escalation, really ensure some level of safety for the individual, and figure out what the next best steps are. Maybe it's going to be hospitalization. Maybe it's not. Maybe we can maintain by providing some sort of plan for the future in that moment. It's not meant to be a therapy. It really is meant to be a brief intervention process. What's really nice about mobile crisis is that it's free. So there's no cost to the consumer about it. For um, obviously there's cost to running these teams, but it's never passed on to the family or the individual. There's no co-pays or things like that. Our teams here in Salt Lake County are a licensed clinician and a peer support specialist. In other counties, it's a licensed clinician, so some sort of mental health provider, and a case manager. Or um, really at this point, anybody who's working in some form of mobile crisis outreach or crisis service is going through a crisis worker certification through the state, which is a 40-hour training. Um, and it it's, touches upon all the different bases of working with somebody who's in crisis, providing de-escalation skills, looking at nuances between um, adults, children, family situations, everything like that. It's, it's actually been a really great um, training for everybody involved. In certain areas, we also have stabilization and mobile response teams. So again, I'll go with Salt Lake because that's where I am and the department that I work for. We actually, our team is um, up and developing. It's going to be provided through children's, um, primary children's. And it's meant to be more of a prevention service. So they want to get involved before the crisis point as things are starting to escalate in the crisis cycle. They provide short-term services, about six to eight weeks, working in-home with the family. So they're providing case management, in-home therapy, um, different levels of planning and behavior modification. What's nice is they go up to the age of 20 when it comes to the children involved. One of their goals is really to work with families with children who have developmental disabilities to help provide that extra support and crisis prevention. They can be reached um, if this is something that you're interested in through um, the Safe Fam. I believe it is uh, 1833. I should have written this down. Um, Safe Fam. And I will double check that. Um, phone number because I want to make sure that everyone has it in the event that they they want it. So um, yes, it is 833 Safe Fam. There's also more information at the utah.gov/smr. And then we have uh, Safe UT, which is a texting. Uh, app that is predominantly um, advertised to youth and individuals in the higher education world, but it really is available for anybody. And people can start a chat and talk with a licensed mental health counselor. Again, both Crisis Line and Text Line are master's level licensed mental health clinicians at this time. Um, so they can have a dialogue back and forth or they can submit a tip. So anonymously, if there's a concern about somebody or something that's happening at one of those schools, they can submit that information um, and get it to school personnel. They can also press the call button and contact somebody at the crisis department at any time. 
So that is always, um, I've had a, a 12 year old text in once and after texting for a few minutes, he's like, this is really hard. Can I just call you? And I said, yeah, just go back to the main screen, push this button, let them know that you want to talk to Amanda. And so he was able to do so and we were able to talk instead of using the texting app. Um, but this is something that's available to everybody. Again, uh, the individual that I was talking about who had been diagnosed with a developmental disability and was um, expressing suicidal ideation in order to gain attention and to have some needs met frequently used our texting app with us. Um, and that was her main way of communicating because that was a lot easier for her. So I know I ran real close to time and Jessica is waiting and Jessica is fabulous. So I'm so excited for her to present for you guys. But if there are any questions or um, anything that's come up, I'm more than happy to answer them as well as um, if there's anybody who uh, needs more support or information, you can always contact me through the crisis line as well. <laughs>